Ah, Halo 4. It's been on the Master Chief Collection for a while now. It's a game remembered for ending a pretty successful video game saga, and basically turning it into a laughing stock. Halo 1, Halo 2, Halo 3, Halo 3 ODST, Halo Reach. It's not a perfect series, but all in all, it's a pretty solid streak for Bungie. How could anyone expect a new company like 343 to live up to Bungie's success? Well, spoiler, they couldn't. With Bungie wanting nothing to do with Halo anymore, Microsoft formed a brand new studio with the express purpose of keeping that brand alive. They hired new talent, got people outside the Halo franchise to spruce it up a little, they wanted to change it, try to revitalize it to a new decade, they went all out. But 343's first entry into Halo wasn't really that well received. Matter of fact, it's kind of despised. Only recently have we seen kind of a return to this game. People changing their minds on whether or not they like Halo 4. So, is 343's first entry into the Halo series really as bad as people say it is? Is it actually a hidden gem? Is it a game that has some merit? Is Halo 4 all that bad? Oh <laughs> uh, no. No, no, no. It's fucking worse. Well, looks like Infinite has completely shat the bed in the last few months, and we've inevitably reached that phase in a Halo game's lifespan where people are kind of looking back on the previous bad games with a little more reverence. You got people coming out of the woodwork saying, actually Halo 4 wasn't that bad. Actually, I liked Halo 4. Actually, Halo 4 had a pretty good campaign. Everywhere you look, you're bound to find some cope regarding Halo 4, praising its story, its campaign, fuck, even its multiplayer. Well, I'm here to completely dispel this nonsensical idea that Halo 4 is anything other than garbage. Because Halo 4 might be one of, if not the worst FPS games I have ever played, at least in recent memory. Potentially of all time, but that's kind of a stretch. It is definitely up there though. It was just a huge shock to me. When it eventually got released on MCC, it was like, wow, this game is actually really worse than people remember it for. Like, it wasn't just mediocre, it wasn't a decent game with some bugs or a few bad mechanics that take away from an otherwise okay experience. No, this game was terrible, borderline unplayable, and an embarrassing product for a company like Microsoft in 343. Halo 4 feels like just another bad sequel in a beloved franchise. You know exactly what I'm talking about, those soulless corporate sequels that are made with no heart, no creativity, and little to no respect for the source material. This is a game backed by Microsoft a game that was supposed to be a follow-up to one of the most well-known franchises in the industry. When Halo 4 was being developed, it was literally the most expensive game Microsoft had ever funded at the time. This is a game that was supposed to mark a new stage in the Halo brand. <laughs> and ironically, the only thing Halo 4 managed to do was end up killing the franchise. Now, I could spend hours talking about why Halo 4 is bad, Hell, I could write a 500-page scientific essay about it, but I'm gonna need to shorten up this video script just so people understand where exactly I'm coming from when I talk about how bad this game really is. Because a lot of people just don't understand why it's bad and why everyone else hates it. I could also go into a rant about 343 Industries themselves. I mean, I could talk about how mismanaged they are, how much animosity there is to both the Halo fanbase and the brand itself. I could also talk about the alleged working conditions mentioned by various contractors and former employees who have all reported a very toxic working environment and click behavior, but I won't. That could be its own whole damn video. And honestly, I'd rather wait until Infinite completely nukes itself before I make that. Suffice to say, 343 is genuinely a bad game development studio, made up of people who clearly don't care for the games they put out. That's a fact. You can defend them all you want in the comments, but that won't change history and all the shit they've done. 343 is an awful studio. No one should be defending them. Besides, there's way more to dissecting a bad game other than just saying the studio that made it is bad. I mean, how could a game like this become so broken and so mismanaged? How is it borderline unplayable? How is it one of the most hated games in the franchise, second only to Halo 5? Why is 4 so bad? What specifically about it do I hate? That's what I want to talk about in this video. So before we look deeper into Halo 4, we've got to do an autopsy on Halo itself. More specifically, we need to look at the Halo franchise right before 343 took over. We need to look at the state of Halo before Halo 4. Alright, we're going to have to breeze through a lot of history because there's a lot of stuff to go over and this video is already pressed for time. Halo 1, 2, and 3, all massive successes in their own right. 
Bungie had a really rough development with Combat Evolved, but those development woes really couldn't stop the juggernaut that was Halo. Combat Evolved not only carried the original Xbox, but it also paved the way for console shooters. The gameplay was great, the graphics looked nice, also the control scheme. Yeah, it used a really obscure control scheme at the time, where the right analog stick looked around and the left analog stick moved you. This would later be adopted by the entire fucking industry for every console shooter afterwards. Its single player was fantastic, if a little simple, it had beautiful atmosphere, a simple interesting story, well-made levels, and enemies that were fun and unique to fight. Its multiplayer was also pretty dope too. Halo 2 followed up Combat Evolved by giving a more story-focused campaign, expanding the universe, having tons of cutscenes, twists and turns, as well as a bigger emphasis on more characters. While the campaign itself was a bit tighter in regards to level design, the combat was expanded even further, with more weapons, vehicles, dual wielding, and more enemies to fight. It was pretty good. However, by far Halo 2's biggest contribution was online multiplayer. Being a flagship title for Xbox Live, its online services were revolutionary, with easy to use matchmaking tools and raking systems that would later be shamelessly replicated for decades to come. Halo 2's development, however, was very rushed. A lot of content was scrapped, single player had to be cut down, and this gave the game an infamous cliffhanger at the end. By sheer coincidence though, the 7th gen was right around the corner, with Xbox 360's releasing in 2005. So Bungie knew that Halo 3 would be a next gen game, and man what a jump that was. Graphically, Halo 3 was amazing, beautiful even. Tech-wise, Halo 3 pulled off some amazing things with the hardware. Massive open environments with tons of enemies, physics, lighting, and online multiplayer. The story was a bit shorter, but it was a definitive end for Halo, wrapping up the series in a neat little bow with the feeling of a grand adventure to end the war once and for all. Gameplay was polished heavily from 2. With the swap of elites to brutes, the combat took a very different shift, but still maintained the general core combat loop. You had to break shields, pop headshots, and you had a mental game of chess as each enemy had their own strategies and tactics. And despite its short campaign, it left a huge impact. Bungie wanted this to be the end. With the end of the Covenant, the Flood being trapped on the Ark, and a final twist for the Forerunners, the game ended its own trilogy gracefully. Sure, a cliffhanger was left near the end, but I don't think Bungie were ever planning on actually following it up. As far as they were concerned, Halo 3 was it. There was no more Halo. Also, multiplayer was expanded dramatically. More maps and more game modes, some of which were originally community fan-made modes for Halo 2, like Infection, and they even introduced a new Forge map editor. This was a very basic map editor, meant for minor adjustments to a map. Like you can move spawn points, vehicles, weapons, crates, maybe add a little bit of cover to an area of the map, slightly change the layout, and that's kinda all Bungie expected players to do. However, this combined with the super intricate game mode editor resulted in an explosion of custom maps that Bungie could never have predicted. People were using this editor far beyond its original purpose, and thanks to the widespreadness of the internet and Xbox Live, this is kind of what propelled Halo 3 into something more than just an ordinary FPS. This is what people remember. A mix of casual big team battle, maybe some try-hard competitive matchmaking, with the occasional chill infection game night full of weird and wacky custom maps made in the Forge editor. Halo 3 was something else, and not a lot of games are able to compete with it. At the time, it was the largest, most successful entertainment product in America. It fucking broke records left and right, and would remain the peak in the Halo franchise ever since. So this should have been the end of the story, but sadly it wasn't. Bungie were still contracted by Microsoft to make two more Halo games. You see, this was the time where Microsoft were beginning to, how should I say, whore out the rights to Halo. They were planning spin-offs, movies, animated shorts. Microsoft saw the potential with Halo success. They kind of wanted their own Star Wars. Bungie obviously probably didn't want to get into a fight with Microsoft over their contracts, so they kind of just had to power through development of two more mainline Halo games before they could finally leave Microsoft and develop a game that wasn't Halo. That would end up being Destiny. That's right, they were done with Halo as far back as 2007, probably even earlier. Yet Bungie would spend the next three years still shackled to Microsoft in the development of ODST and Reach. Honestly, if you never knew this before, this is kind of why ODST and Reach turned out the way they were. They were both prequels, they didn't expand much beyond Halo 3, and ODST especially was kind of just a Halo 3 asset flip. Honestly, Bungie probably saw it as just an expansion pack, but they probably wanted it to sell for 60 bucks so daddy Microsoft would think it's an official mainline release. Also, Reach took a lot of precedence over ODST. ODST was kind of the one that was whipped together in the meantime, as Reach's development took priority. But Reach also didn't go through development unscathed. The story itself went through a ton of drafts and changes, and in the end it kind of turned into just a 
plotless run and gun through various scenarios and set pieces. Both games removed some sandbox features from 3, but Reach was made for one thing above all all else, which is what I think it excels at better than most Halo games, community support. You see hardcore competitive players lament Halo Reach for not having competitive maps, having armor lock, and weapon bloom. But Halo Reach really wasn't made for the competitive audience. Instead, you get the feeling that Bungie made Halo Reach for community features first and foremost. Its forge mode was the most robust forge to date. Like seriously, Halo Reach's forge editor remains the most beloved map editor in the entire Halo franchise. Sure, a few forges that came after were a little more robust, but Halo Reach's was the simplest, easiest to understand, and Halo Reach's combat was just simply good to play, unlike other games that we won't mention. Because aside from the lack of competitive maps and some quirks with the gameplay, Halo Reach remains a solid game. Guns feel great, combat feels amazing, elites were the focus once again, and overall I think Halo Reach's combat is top tier. It's a very underrated Halo game in that regard. This combined with the immense custom game support, allowing players to create even more custom game modes, Halo Reach was really an admirable send-off from Bungie. This was the last good Halo game Halo fans ever got to see. Bungie left, Destiny began production, and Microsoft needed a new studio to take over. So they chose 343. 343 were a special studio formed for the explicit purpose of taking over the Halo brand. And they also attempted to expand it. You see, while Halo carved out its own large community, Microsoft had been one-upped by a much larger FPS juggernaut, Call of Duty. Hey, remember earlier how I said that Halo 3 was the largest selling entertainment product in America when it came out? Well, literally, not even two months later, Call of Duty 4 came out, and it beat Halo 3. By quite a bit. Call of Duty really changed how Microsoft saw Halo. And so began what I like to call the normification of Halo, where it began to get diluted and watered down just to appeal to a large audience. 343 devs were literally chosen because they were looking for people who didn't like Halo. I'm not kidding. The idea was to make a Halo game that non-Halo fans could get into. They wanted Halo 4 to have huge mass appeal as opposed to just focusing on its core audience. So the idea was, hey, let's just hire people who fucking hate Halo so we can get their input on what needs to be changed. Then we can fix Halo and get more people who once hated Halo. That's a win-win, right? This strategy sounds fucking insane when I say it now in the year 2022. Any idiot with two brain cells can tell you that diluting a game's uniqueness through developers that hate that specific game is a pretty bad idea and is a guaranteed recipe for a bad game. But back in the early 2010s, this was a strategy that a lot of developers tried. That lowest common denominator of people who liked Call of Duty was just too tempting. And so many franchises died trying to grab that. We see it less now, but God, back in those days, it felt like nothing was sacred. And Halo was yet another casualty of that. Halo Anniversary was quickly whipped up in 2011 under 343's oversight and mainly Saber Interactive's development. It was just a cheap remaster of Halo 1. It's awful. It replaced the graphics with randomly chosen assets from Halo Reach, it gave the whole game an ugly color filter, and it just looks like a complete mess. I mean, just look at this. They sold this for $60. But hey, you could still switch to OG graphics, but who the hell would buy Halo 1 again for 60 bucks 10 years after it originally released? That was definitely a sign of things to come. Then Halo 4 was announced. There was a decent level of hype at first, it was a direct sequel to Halo 3, a different developer, and a lot of people were kind of excited. I mean, the writing was absolutely on the wall, and a lot of people understood that Halo 4 was not going to be the game that people wanted it to be. But for whatever reason, people were still excited, and a lot of them were kind of just in denial. Halo does something weird to the brain, it makes you miss things that are blindingly obvious in hindsight, mainly how bad the game looks now. Anyway, tons of teaser trailers came out, people spent hours overanalyzing the fuck out of each of them. Halo 4 finally released, by a developer that hated Halo, with a campaign that doesn't feel like Halo, a story that doesn't fit Halo, and a game that looks worse than Halo. And that's where we are. I could do a whole video on 343's constant fumbles and failures, but we're here to talk about just Halo 4. Halo 4 is enough for a two-parter video. I played Halo 4 when it came out. For the life of me, I don't even remember what I thought of this game when it released. The thing is, I replay every Halo game. Every Halo single player I regularly try and revisit. I mean, they're all fun. Some missions more than others, obviously, but overall they have a lot of value. And as a kid, I was a huge Halo fan, both multiplayer and campaign. Halo was my life, and I always would find myself coming back to these games, either having fun in a match or enjoying a chill level of the campaign. But not Halo 4. Halo 4 I apparently beat, and I've never touched again. 
I recall playing some multiplayer and then quite literally going back to Reach, and eventually I got a PC and I moved on from Halo entirely. Now that MCC is on PC again, I'm able to revisit it. I was always curious to know what happened. Why did I never revisit Halo 4 as much as I did, say, Halo 3 or Halo Reach? Well, I now know the answer. When Halo 4 came to MCC, I finally decided to give it a replay. And here we are. Me with a completely new understanding of how bad this game truly is, and a whole new hatred for how 343 made this game. So I'm going to break down everything that's wrong with this game. I've been debating how to approach this video. Maybe do a recap on Halo 4's story, maybe showcase the game level by level. Nope. Instead, I've decided that I'm going to pick apart every single worthwhile aspect of this game point by point, until I paint a big enough picture to show just how bad Halo 4 is. I don't deny that some people may like this game. You're wrong, but I won't deny that you like it. But I want this video to serve as an explanation for why I don't like Halo 4. Why me and many, many Halo fans hate Halo 4. I want to show why this game is a failure, not just for a Halo game, but for a first-person shooter in general. In nearly every single regard Halo 4 is a failure and a lot of people just don't understand that. The problem is when people think about Halo 4 they'll think of like one point that they hate about it and kind of attribute everything to that. Like Halo 4, oh, I don't like the art style or Halo 4, oh, I don't like the Prometheans or Halo 4, oh, I don't like the big team battle game mode. And they'll just kind of leave it at that like no one really analyzes why Halo 4 is a terrible game. That's what I'm here to do. I'm here to finally shine a light on what Halo 4 does objectively wrong. So I'm gonna go point by point, topic by topic, mainly focusing on the campaign, but I'll briefly talk about multiplayer, but I'm going in depth into why this game is bad. This video has bloated beyond its original length, so I'm afraid that quite a few stuff is gonna take a back seat or might not even be mentioned at all. So just know that if your specific least liked thing of Halo 4 isn't mentioned, it's because there was even bigger fish to fry. So yeah, I'm mainly gonna be focusing on single player, I'll mention multiplayer here and there, and I'm gonna do this all segment by segment. Anyways, this video is long enough as is. Let's get right into the plot. Halo 4's plot feels like fan fiction. What do I mean by that? Well, Halo 4's story is awful. And it isn't just that the writing is bad, which it is, don't get me wrong, it's fucking terrible. This writing is awful. It's clearly written by someone who doesn't have an understanding or even a desire to understand the Halo universe. Gosh, where have I seen that before? Sequels like Halo 2 and Halo 3 tried to expand the Halo universe while also maintaining consistency with the previous games. Halo 4 doesn't do either. Instead, Halo 4 tries to expand the universe, but in doing so, ends up making it feel even more smaller and disconnected from previous Halo games. This is ultimately why the game feels like bloated fanfiction. Let's start with why the writing is bad. One of the weird things I keep seeing reported when people talk about Halo 4 is a lot of people think the story is good. Like, seriously, critics praise the story. A lot of people even have the audacity to call it the most emotional campaign in the series. Are you kidding me? What story are you guys talking about? Did I play a completely fucking different game? Here's why the writing doesn't work. Not just for a Halo game, but for a game in general. First, setup is lazy. You need to remember that Halo 4 is supposed to be carrying off of Halo 3. Guess what happened in Halo 3? I'll give you a guess. That's right, elites broke away from the Covenant, fought alongside humanity, the Covenant is no more, Prophet of Truth and the other Prophets have been dead, and the Flood is completely isolated on the Ark. That's it. That's the end of Halo. Humanity isn't faring too well either. Remember, 800 planets are completely gone. Earth is in near ruins. What remains of the elites, the humans, and kind of the rest of the Covenant are just these very bare-bone factions. Neither side at this point has the capacity to continue the war, which was kind of the point at the end of Halo 3. It gave the idea that our next step was to rebuild and recollect. That was the next step for humanity and the Covenant. In Halo Reach, the ending time skipped 37 years in the future, where we see humanity finally recolonizing the planet of Reach. For context, Reach is the closest human colony to Earth. That becomes important later once I talk about how Halo 4 is fanfiction, don't worry. So the universe is in disarray, the Covenant are gone, the elites are the good guys, the Flood is presumably destroyed, or at the very least trapped far beyond the outer rim of the galaxy. How do you set up your game then? And this is the one time where I'm going to give some defense to 343. This wasn't their fault. This was Microsoft's fault. Bungie had their trilogy wrapped up in a nice bow. Microsoft wanted to unwrap it and basically remake Halo 1 through 3 again. Of course, it's hard to do that when Halo 3 is literally the ultimate ending to the franchise. So, 343 were kind of in a conundrum. What do you do? Well, 
343 came up with a solution, and this is the solution that every single god-awful reboot as of late does, where you just have to stretch your world's backstory to the point of absurdity until it can loop all the way back to the status quo that was in the original games. Don't even worry if it's at the expense of everything that came before it. You just gotta make all those other stories worthless so you're back to a state of conflict for the sequel. Basically, if you've ever seen the new Star Wars movies, it's that. It's a perfect example of what 343 did. A lot of hack writers do this too. There's no attempt to write a story that fits the world and expands beyond it. Instead, writers are encouraged to change the world itself, make the world fit your dumb story, not the other way around. Especially if your story is just ripping off the original story in the first place, and then you just gotta loop everything back around until the original bad guys are once again the bad guys. The Covenant got defeated at the end of 3. Well, introduce more Covenant, a new Covenant, and these guys are uh, they're a separate faction, but they're also the same Covenant that we know from before. They're also elites. Why are elites still fighting for a cause that tried to genocide them? Eh, just try not to ask too many questions. It's the Covenant. The Covenant's back, you guys. It's the fucking Covenant. And humanity is back with brand new Spartans, only trained in less than four years. Yippee. Wait, what do you mean humanity was on the verge of extinction in Halo 3, with literally one human planet left standing? Nah, they're back to being a spacefaring civilization. Everything is booming right now. Look at all their ships. They literally have the biggest class of starships ever designed by humanity. Somehow humanity's doing pretty great. Halo rings are deactivated and the Ark is destroyed. Actually, there's a ton more Forerunner weapons out there. Like the super ancient evil bad guy with his super ancient Iron Man armor who wants to turn humanity into ancient robot space knights. <sighs> Anyways, let me list some gripes that I have with the story, then I'll get into the meat of what I hate with Halo 4's plot. The good news is these Covenant aren't outfitted like standard military. It's possible we just came across a rogue salvage ship. I'm a Halo fan, you'll know that. I'm someone who has played Combat Evolved through Reach. I've read books, played spin-offs, and let me tell you, I still have no fucking idea who these guys are. Like, I'm serious, I literally still kinda don't know who these guys are. I've inferred who they are, and I'm guessing that they're kinda just some offshoot of the Covenant led by an Elite, cause Elites are still in this new Covenant even though they were kicked out of the old one. I'm kinda guessing that they're not with the Arbiter, I'm guessing they still hate humanity and they still believe in the Great Journey. But aside from that, I really have no idea where they came from or what the fuck they're doing. Halo 4 marked a shift in every Halo game following it, where simply playing the game wasn't enough to understand the backstory or setup for the start of the game. So when you start a 343 Halo game, you have no fucking idea what's going on unless you read the books, the comics, watch the show, read the spin-off series. Hey, you play Halo 3, guess what? You just need to know what happened in Halo 1 and 2. Halo 4, nope, you gotta watch all these spin-offs, you gotta read the books, you gotta know the new lore, you gotta know who the didact is, you gotta know who these new Covenant are. The moment you start this game, you are assaulted by random out of context cutscenes that have no bearing on the story, followed by the return of bad guy elites and grunts, and the Covenant. What the hell? What happened to them between 3 and 4? What happened to us defeating them in Halo 3? Why are the elites bad guys now? Oh wait, we do get kind of an explanation. I thought we had a truce with the Covenant. A lot can happen in four years. Yeah, that's uh, that's all we get. Okay, but seriously, can the game simply explain what's happening? Literally, just give us a teeny bit of exposition to tell us who these guys are. Who are they? Why are they flying Covenant ships? Why are they made up of elites? Didn't the elites rebel against the Covenant? Why are they still calling themselves the Covenant? So, looking into it, there are obviously some kind of Covenant remnant. Because when you make a reboot to a successful trilogy whose main bad guys were defeated at the end of it, you simply have to rehash the same faction yet again. We've gone through this before. This Covenant pretty much acts the exact same as the previous one. They got elaborate armor, they have advanced technology, huge starships. For a small fledgling remnant force, they sure have quite a uniform military. So right off the bat, anybody who's played the games, and only the games, is fucking confused. And the people who maybe have read the books and the comics and trading cards are still confused, because this huge shift to the scope of the Halo universe is just glossed over like it's nothing. Hey, imagine if years after World War II, after the end of the war, a Japanese fleet broke away from Japan and declared war on the US. That would kinda have huge fucking ramifications for the world as a whole. And it's not something that would just be glossed over in the history books. It sure as hell wouldn't be treated as a footnote. So that's all I'm saying. The setup to Halo 4's brand new covenant is non-existent and could have used a bit more of an introduction. And also, the simple premise is stupid as well. 
An entire new faction arising from the ashes of an old regime is a neat idea, except when that new order is portrayed identically, virtually indistinguishable from the old bad guys, to the point where you can just call them by the same name and it still fits, then it's clear that you're just getting lazy. However, playing devil's advocate, I know full well that 343 would never be able to make their own faction anywhere near as good as the covenant that Bungie made. So again, I'm kinda on the fence of whether or not 343 should make their own new faction, or if they should just take the one that Bungie made, because 343 can't be trusted with making anything. Personally, I think that if there was any true Remnant Covenant faction, it wouldn't be led by the Sangheili, but I think it would actually be led by the San Shayum. It's weird how in 343's lore, they literally just forgot about this species. The San Shayum literally disappear from 343's lore. You know, the San Shayum. The fucking masterminds behind the Covenant. The main species ruling everything. The very species that came up with the Great Journey, and the very same species that had a rivalry with the elites that was so strong it broke the Covenant in two and marked the downfall for themselves and the survival of humanity. Yeah, those guys. I think it'd be kind of fun to see them again. I mean, you can still have some grunts and jackals, maybe some brutes, but give me some awesome looking San Shayum prelates. This is the perfect opportunity to introduce a new core enemy group. Give me some San Shayum armor. They have a very sleek and skinny silhouette that would contrast pretty well against 343's bulky designs. Give me some scheming prophets. Give me some fun alien politics that Halo 2 had. The San Shayum should have replaced elites in Halo 4. There, I said it. They should have been the main bad guys, and they should have been what 343's Halo trilogy should have revolved around. But no, instead we get some generic elites who are still the bad guys, except they look like hulking monsters, because of course they do. This is 343 we're talking about, remember? Everything looks ugly, and we're just recycling enemies at this point, because fuck world building. Although, I'm not even sure if I want 343 to introduce more enemies, out of fear for how badly they'd fuck it up. Well, he's just a ray of sunshine, isn't he? I keep calling this game fanfiction, and it's for kind of a few specific reasons. It's not just because this game is badly written, or because it doesn't care for the lore that came before it, or that the characters are written inconsistently, or that the Covenant was literally revived out of nowhere. It's not just because of that. It's mainly because of the Prometheans, and specifically the Didact. To me, this is peak fanfic material. It's got that feeling where someone writing the story kinda likes Halo, but they want to introduce their own new faction into the universe. Oh, look out, here come the Prometheans and the Didact. Aren't they so badass? Aren't they so cool? Oh my gosh, look at the Didact, he's so cool. He wears an Iron Man suit, isn't he cool? He can vaporize people and turn them into robots, isn't that cool? This is a pretty big fanfiction trope, where some alternate faction or new bad guy is introduced, very clearly intended by the author to be the big baddie supreme, and yet their style just doesn't really mesh with the rest of the universe. It's kind of like a self-insert character, but it's a self-insert villain, where the villain is meant to be better and cooler and more interesting than all the rest of the villains in the Halo series, but it kind of comes off as fanfiction, because that's what it is. Halo is military science fiction. It's about war, combined arms, huge battles, two armies fighting each other. I fucking love that shit. And up until 343 Halo, it mostly revolved around that. The factions were militaristic, very focused, and full of intricacies that made them unique. Soldiers, officers, generals. While the premise was fantastical, the actual setup to everything had a layer of authenticity. Sure, there's a focus on characters, but by and large, the plots remain big and they revolve around huge war-sized conflicts. In fact, in most Halo games, there isn't necessarily a distinct single bad guy. The Prophets are interesting because they're definitely the major antagonist of Halo 2, and then Truth becomes the antagonist of Halo 3, but they're more so just leaders of the Covenant. The only reason they're antagonists is because they run everything. They give the orders, they command generals, they run the war effort, kinda like a real war. There isn't a scene where the Prophet of Truth picks up an energy sword, puts on an Iron Man suit, and fights Chief one-on-one. -on -one. The Prophet of Regret is literally defended by his guards, because without them he gets beaten to a pulp like it's nothing. There are these gangly pencil pushers in charge of their army. There are these weak, spineless leaders that run the Covenant. That's who they are, and that's what gives them a sense of authenticity. A good example is somebody like Tartarus. He's a physically strong warrior who's kind of matched by the Arbiter. Except he's not the leader of the Covenant. He's a dumb, simple-minded brute the Prophets use as muscle. He's a lapdog who never questions his orders and gets promptly destroyed for that. So that's what I like about the Covenant, is there isn't one definitive evil bad guy that you have to fight at the end. It's just an entire war effort full of generals, commanders, leaders, and then really low-end cannon fodder. 
kind of like a real war. That's what I love about Bungie's Halo. They focused on the war aspects of their military sci-fi shooter. Now, of course, people might bring up Guilty Spark. He's kind of similar to the Didact, but there's a bit more to him than just evil monster man in a spacesuit. He's an artificial intelligence, and he's basically a mouthpiece for the Sentinels. He's a remnant of Forerunner technology, and he's just a drone built to follow his orders and nothing more. He knows the risk of the Flood. Hell, when you consider the damage that was done by not letting him activate Halo in the first game and letting the Flood spread, you can kind of see that maybe he had a point. He's an intelligent but very narrow-minded monitor who's only evil because his goals just don't align with ours. It's simple as that. The Grave Mind is also another big villain, and he's this creepy, malevolent hive mind. He's an ancient being from a bygone era, kind of like Guilty Spark. He's not this supervillain who wishes to conquer humanity. He's a fucking terrifying intelligence that needs to consume and survive. And to do that, he's just going to spread as much as he can to keep himself alive. He's just an intelligent consciousness that serves as a mouthpiece for the Flood itself. He doesn't seek to just wipe out humanity. He just seeks to consume and spread just so the Flood can survive as a species. What these villains have that the Didact lacks is subtle motivation, as well as an adherence to military science fiction. They're unique, they're interesting, they make your imagination race and wonder about their history, where they came from, what exactly they are. It's fascinating and is exactly what Halo is about. You take one look at the Didact and you just start asking questions that take you out of the story. How has this one single forerunner stayed alive for thousands of years? Why does he have his own personal army of robots to destroy humanity? Did he build those himself? Seems like a lot of work if you ask me. Forerunners created the Sentinels, but those are general purpose robots numbering probably in the trillions. Simple multi-purpose machines to stop flood outbreaks. Why would the forerunners ever build these humanoid looking robots? Or these dog robots? or these little floating machines that have tiny little faces on them. And more importantly, why would they give full command to one guy who looks like a vampire? And yeah, going back to that, why would the Forerunners give them faces? Doesn't that kind of defeat the purpose of Forerunner design? It's supposed to be abstract and simple and unreadable, and it has this cold, emotionless feel to it. But no, all these Prometheans have these little angry monster men faces to them, even the Watchers. Matter of fact, the robots have skulls inside their faces. Apparently, the Didact is just a rogue Forerunner turning humanity into his own robot army. But wait, why does he need dogs? Or little people with wings? Are those also humans? If he was the disgraced Forerunner, how did he get all the resources to build the Composer? Did he build it himself? Did he steal it? Why would the Forerunners create something like a Composer then? So he probably built him himself, that's what I'm guessing. This is the moment, with the introduction of the Didact, that Halo crossed over and became Cape Shit. This plot might work in, say, a superhero comic book, but in a series all about military sci-fi, this just feels horribly out of place. Halo is a series that loves the intricate details of waging an interstellar war, with factions full of ranks and classes and hierarchies. This is just weirdly out of place. He's just a really unfitting villain. This guy who wears an Iron Man suit with his own legion of robots just popped into the Halo universe to take over humanity. Please tell me that doesn't sound like a fucking fanfiction.net story. His aesthetic doesn't fit at all, the Prometheans look nothing like Forerunner technology, he looks nothing like how a Forerunner should look, running around getting into fist fights with a guy in armor primitively made by humanity. If he was Forerunner, I'd expect him to be sitting in like a big chair letting all his machines take care of everything for him. You'd think he'd be like pompous or something, like humanity would be so beneath him. But no, apparently he wears that Iron Man suit so he can get into fist fights with Master Chief. This is what Halo has devolved into. Fan fiction. This is something some kid wrote with no concern for outfits into the overall big picture, no concern if it has good cohesion with the universe. And then the Forerunners had robots that fought Master Chief and the Didact was also a Forerunner, but he had super tough space armor and he led his robots to Earth, but was thwarted by Master Chief who fought him in the duel. 343, couldn't you have come up with something better? Honestly, I think the Didact could have worked if you made him, say, very different tone-wise. Get rid of his armor. Hell, don't make him a bipedal forerunner. Make him something else. Make him like a giant bizarre looking alien, like a precursor perhaps. Something weird looking and completely different to what we've seen before. Give us something alien. Something that doesn't look like Master Chief would be able to take him in a brawl. Don't give us a villain that spouts generic platitudes and has a simple-minded goal of destroying Earth. Give us a villain with nuance. Something that is linked far beyond Chief and humanity. Something that has its own unique motivation and goals. Hey, wasn't it cool how the Covenant had this long, huge 20 year war to wipe out all of humanity planet by planet, and it was this slow, really long military campaign? Hey, remember how intricate and detailed that was? Man, that was cool. But the Didact, no, he just grabs an evil super spaceship, flies to Earth to destroy it. That's all he's doing. And he might have a hatred of humanity, except I have no fucking idea what it is because the game doesn't explain it. Because remember, this is 343 we're talking about. Also, that brings up another question. Why, uh, 
Why would he just fly to Earth to wage war on all of humanity? He's like one guy. Hey, if I were a forerunner that was resurrected thousands of years after my own people went extinct, the first thing I probably wouldn't do would be to wage war on some random civilization I have little to no preparation for. I mean, it takes one single nuclear warhead to stop me. Uh, yeah, nope. I'm gonna peace out of here. I'm gonna figure my plan out for a bit. Hey guys, do you remember the Gravemind? Do you remember how the grave mind took his time before he attacked humanity? Do you remember how he intentionally let a human and elite do most of the heavy lifting for him? And he did it twice? Both times just to ensure his own survival, as well as give him a little bit more time to build up his army? Remember that scene where the grave mind beelined it to Earth and had a huge space battle where he was vastly outnumbered and then immediately was destroyed? No wait, he didn't do that. He kept buying time. He sent smaller flood ships to probe space, and then he waited until the Covenant were all but defeated to spring his invasion of the Ark. I'm kind of rambling, but my point for this whole section is that the Didact just isn't Halo. Having a guy in an Iron Man suit run around like a mustache twirling villain doesn't fit here. It might fit in, say, an Avengers movie, but not in a military sci-fi series that has an emphasis on, you know, military sci-fi. His motivation is weak, his planning is weak, he's just a lame villain, and his army of robots feel completely out of place with what was once a pretty unified aesthetic across the Halo games. Robots with little angry eyes and little angry mouths, with guns that look like human weapons too. Oh, don't worry, I'm going to talk more about that once we get into the designs, don't worry. But yeah, that's kind of why Halo 4 feels like fan fiction. The didact is just kind of dumb. Hey, I got a question for you. What exactly is a Reclaimer? Well, you're gonna get two answers depending on who you ask. One if you ask Frank O'Connor, aka the guy who was writing entry logs for Halo 3 and had little to no creative involvement in the story itself, and then a completely different answer for the rest of fucking Bungie. Okay, here's what a Reclaimer was in Bungie's Halo. Reclaimers were humanity, and in Bungie's Halo, they were forerunners. Humans are forerunners. Mudgy made this explicitly clear in their dialogue, in plot elements, and in the fucking themes that bind the games together. The word Reclaimer literally explains this in its definition, to regain possession of. The Forerunners once had a vast empire over the universe, and after its disappearance, humanity is now left to reclaim it. Humanity is literally reclaiming their technology that they once possessed. They're repossessing it. And don't fucking start with me, you lore nerds who believe 343 lore is canon. Humans are forerunners in Bungie's games, and it was established as early as Halo 1, backed up in Halo 2, and pretty much fucking outright said in Halo 3. It was even hinted in Reach, too. Knowledge. A birthright from an ancient civilization. In Comet Evolved, we literally get called Reclaimer, which is what I said before. Pretty self-fucking evident what it means in the name. It's also interesting because out of every other alien species on this ring during Comet Evolved, you got Sangheili, Ungoy, Kidgar, Legolo, there's probably a few engineers hovering around. The one species that Guilty Spark is comfortable enough to seek out is Master Chief, a human. But you already knew that. I mean... How could you? Left out that little detail, did he? We have followed outbreak containment procedure to the letter. You were with me each step of the way as we managed this crisis. Chief, I'm picking up movement. Why would you hesitate to do what you've already done? We need to go right now. Last time you asked me if it were my choice, would I do it? Having had considerable time to ponder your query, my answer has not changed. There is no choice. We must activate the ring. At the end of the game, 343 is given a chance to scan through the Pillar of Autumn's databanks. He's also able to sift through all of humanity's history. And what does he say to this? He says this. Imagine how exciting this is to have a record of all of our lost time. Human history is it? Fascinating. Huh, that's a pretty interesting choice of words. All of our lost time? Human history is apparently our lost time, according to Guilty Spark. Seems pretty easy to understand to me. Hey, did you know that Bungie staff, Jason Jones, Mario Donald, and Joe Staten, yeah, that Joe Staten, sat around and did a commentary track for Halo 1 back when Halo 3 released? Do you want to know what they had to say about this specific line of dialogue? He looks excited, doesn't he? All of our lost time? What does that mean? Human history, is it? Oh. Mm. <laughs> Fascinating. <laughs> That's a clue. Hmm, seems like Bungie seemed to know what I'm talking about as well. Anyway, we get to Halo 2, we learned far more about the Covenant, mainly how their war against humanity is literally religious, they worship the foreigners as gods, they use their technology, they've declared a holy crusade against humans as a species, but why? 
Well, a lot of backstory has been added since Halo 2, mainly that the three prophets basically conspired together to take power after exploring the Forerunner Dreadnought and finding some unspeakable secret inside it. They immediately stumbled upon some information that completely changed their perspective of humanity. What could they have possibly found out inside that Dreadnought that made them so shocked that they would swear a secret oath with one another while also ordering their forces to commit a blind genocide against an entire species. Unlike every single species that they conquered and formed into their covenant, humanity never got the offer to join. This is the same humanity that can quite literally access any Forerunner technology with their fucking DNA. Something that no other species in the covenant can do, and the fact that the prophets are explicitly aware of. It makes you think. My theory, and I don't know if I'm qualified to say this, maybe it's because of, oh, I don't know, maybe it's because the Hierarchs found out the truth that the Forerunners were humanity. Maybe that was the truth. The truth was that they were not these mythical beings that had been idolized too much by the Covenant. Instead, they were this fledgling small civilization that the Covenant despised. The Covenant's gods were no more than these primitive apes. Not only that, but the Covenant saw that this ape civilization had a stronger claim to this Forerunner technology than even the Covenant did. That the Covenant were not the true heirs to the Forerunner, but it was humanity instead, this lowly primitive civilization. Seems like a pretty damn good reason if you ask me for why some prophet might go crazy hearing this. Your pal, where's he going? Uh, the village hardly started, and this time, none of you be left wait, wait, wait. What was that? Can you repeat that, please? And this time, none of you will be left behind. Hmm. You mean that Truth is heading to Earth, and eventually to the Ark, to activate the Halo Array, meaning this time none of you will be left behind. That's an interesting type of wordplay. It's like you're implying that humanity were directly related to the firings of the Halo Rings the first time. Almost like they should have disappeared the first time and ended up not disappearing. That's kind of a cheeky remark, if you ask me. Also, fun fact, did you know in Halo 2, a cut storyboard includes the Arbiter finding a casket with a human skeleton in it? Pretty cool stuff. Lastly, we get to Halo 3. Halo 3 is all about the Ark. Yet, the one way you get to the Ark is through the portal at Voy. So why would the Ark, one of the most important facilities made by the Forerunners, more important than all the other Halo rings combined, this is something that can build its own Halo Array. It can activate every Halo Array at will. It makes all those Halo Rings pretty much redundant. This is the most important structure the Forerunners have pretty much built and have left standing in the galaxy. Why would this structure only be accessible from a planet like Earth and only Earth? And conveniently in a region of Africa that primitive humanity likely evolved from. Hmm... Seems kind of obvious to me. Anyways, aside from the obvious hints throughout the game, mainly the fact that once again, only humanities connects with Forerunner tech, gee golly, I wonder why that might be. We get to the end, where Guilty Spark, the man himself who began our trek down the Forerunner to human pipeline, quite literally says this to Master Chief. You are the child of my makers, inheritor of all they left behind. You are Forerunner. But this ring is mine. Well, I don't know about you guys, but that seems pretty fucking conclusive to me. Child of my makers, inheritor of all they left behind, you are a forerunner? Master Chief, a human, a descendant of forerunners, is forerunner. Uh, yeah, that's, uh, that's kind of a huge fucking reveal that pretty much cements this as canon. Humans are forerunners. That's it. That's something that's not debatable in Bungie's games. It's there. It's literally stated multiple times. End of story. They say it right here at the end of Halo 3. That's the big reveal of Halo 3. You are Forerunner. So people unfamiliar with 343's lore might be kind of confused right now. They might be thinking, well, you know, this was portrayed in Bungie's lore. What, did 343 just not follow this? Did 343 miss this? I don't know either. I think 343 maybe just forgot what went on in the previous Halo games. Maybe no one at 343 ever played a Halo game to completion. Honestly, that wouldn't surprise me. Because in Halo 4, the Forerunners are not humanity, but instead they're these angry looking monster men dudes from another species. Yeah. Another species that waged war against ancient humanity, so an ancient humanity that was also around at the same time, and the Flood, but also spacefaring humanity that was also ancient at the time. Yeah, 
<laughs> what? So that's 343's ultimate slaughtering of the Halo lore, is what was once a pretty important reveal for the Forerunners being humanity, is no longer the case with 343's lore. Now the Forerunners are just a separate species that actually hates humanity. They fucking fought wars with humanity back in the day. And people still try to debate this in 343's defense, which I don't even know what the point is anymore. Because the only evidence that 343 has on their side are a few text logs from Halo 3 in a single comic. Yes text logs. What these text logs and this single comic page do is that they hint at the fact that the Forerunners might not be humans. So technically 343 may never have broken canon, it's technically canon that the Forerunners are a different species. This is some bullshit. First, I've looked through these. The entry logs, the boring comic, and if anything, I'd be hard pressed to find anything that explicitly states humanity and the Forerunners are unrelated. They mention the Didact, the Creators, Minicate Bias does make a distinction between Reclaimer and Forerunner. However, if anything, there's even hints that Reclaimers and the Creators are one and the same. Literally, the sum of the text logs end pretty much with this idea. Either way, these logs are pretty shoddily written, and I don't care what anyone else has to say about it, because guess what? Guilty Spark literally calls Master Chief a Forerunner. The story itself confirms it. Not some hidden text log that you have to find. No, this is in the story that is confirmed. Look, Guilty Spark says it right fucking here. So does the Prophet of Mercy and the Prophet of Truth even. Your forefathers wisely set aside their compassion, steeled themselves for what needed to be done. I see now why they left you behind. But no, because instead, some guy who barely worked on Halo 3 wrote a bunch of text terminals, and this somehow invalidates the years of world building and setup. Hey, wait a minute. Who is the guy who wrote these terminals? Oh. This aside, the fact of the matter is one reveal is simply a better story element than the other. Humanity being the literal descendants of Forerunners adds to the tragic nature of Halo's overarching plot. It adds a sense of tragedy to the Human Covenant War, this covenant empire built upon the idealization of these Forerunners who are looked up to as gods, only to find out that the remnants of Forerunners are just humanity, these seemingly lowly creatures being wiped out by their very followers. Thematically, this is fucking fantastic stuff. Remnants of a species forgotten past, humanity being destined to reclaim their old control over the galaxy, given access to their old technology, their ships, their ring worlds, having to deal with a species that sees themselves as the true inheritors of you, forced to reconcile with their beliefs in the reality of the Forerunners being these mere humans on the brink of survival, that's a pretty awesome premise. And it basically brings all the themes of the Halo universe together. A neat bow that wraps up the Forerunner subplot while also giving Halo 3 an even more hopeful ending. In Halo 4, 343 is awkwardly forced to retcon away all these hints in the previous Halo games. Shit like Reclaimer, Chief being Forerunner, Humanity being descendants of the Forerunners, you can't really sweep this shit under the rug. So how do you retcon this? Well, anyone who's played Halo 4 remembers the infamously bad Reclaimer cutscene. A cutscene that makes no sense, kills so much of Halo's lore that predates it, and serves as a boring, dull exposition that completely ruins Halo's once neat world building. That's what this cutscene is. First, the word Reclaimer gets stretched beyond imagination. Reclaimer still now refers to humanity, except it's now used in the specific sense that humanity is the next species to take over from the Forerunners control the galaxy. Like, there's something called a mantle of responsibility that is introduced as this thing that is passed down to certain species, and like, every species that holds it just now has full control of the galaxy and they give it to another species. But Forerunners really didn't want humanity to have it, but the librarian chose humanity to take over after humans were almost wiped out. So the universe is now like a book club where just some random species gets full control of it for every few thousand years. I guess that's how that works. Secondly, Master Chief is no longer Forerunner in the sense that humanity are Forerunners, nor is he a child of the Forerunners in the sense that humanity are the descendants of Forerunners. Instead, Master Chief is quite literally built by Forerunners. I am not even joking. You see, the librarian placed a hidden gene song inside humanity for thousands of years that literally implanted into humanity's DNA the command to create the Spartan program, to create Cortana, and for Master Chief to be created. Literally, John 117 was born to specifically become a forerunner so that he would then be destined to withstand certain weapons used by other forerunners like the Didact. And this was all foreseen by the librarian, literally knowing Master Chief, Cortana, and the Spartan program would exist thousands of years in the past. Master Chief is literally the chosen one. What? What? 
What? Hey, remember what made Master Chief cool? It was the fact that he was just like any other Spartan, except he had one thing no one else had. Can you guess? Luck. He was lucky. He got by on the skin of his teeth. He just barely made it out of unwinnable situations. He was the last surviving Spartan, the last of his kind, and as a result, he was also the toughest. That's it. That's why Master Chief is cool. He could have easily died in Halo 1, 2, or 3, but he managed to just barely get by. That's why people like him. That's why he's cool. He's an empty shell for a player to self-insert into to get immersed in the world. Kind of in the same way that Doom Guy is just a suit of armor for a player to play in. Halo 4 does something that I fucking hate. They add in Destiny. No, not that Destiny. That Destiny. The fact that Master Chief was literally destined to stop the Didact. The fact that he, Cortana, and the fucking Spartan program itself were all pre-planned over thousands of lifetimes by some alien bitch who implanted this stuff in our DNA. Am I the only one who feels like that ruins just everything? Why can't things just happen? What happened to circumstance? What happened to chance or luck? What happened to my military sci-fi that had main characters regularly die off? If anything, Bungie's Halo was explicitly against characters having destiny. People got killed off left and right, entire shipfuls of marines killed over the course of a game, whole Spartan teams dying off not making it to some grand destined calling, but instead dying in a hopeless losing situation, alone and left behind, merely there to serve as someone to pass the baton to somebody else. That was a microcosm of the entire human covenant war, the sacrifice of each soldier, each marine, just in the hopes that maybe, just maybe, it would help in the long run, but you can never be certain it would. But nope. Instead, we now have destiny, we have space magic, and fuck you. Cape shit. Also, wait a minute. How does a gene song, you know, even work? Because, like, being able to invent stuff isn't in your DNA. Did, like, some random engineer get the idea on the toilet to invent Mjolnir armor? Is that how that works? Also, Mjolnir armor isn't just an isolated invention. It's a refinement upon many other technologies and developments, and is itself kind of just this broad technology as well. Like, it's just an exoskeleton. Exoskeletons have been a concept for decades. Matter of fact, some are being prototyped in real life right now. Are these ones also being created from the Gene Song? Plus, in canon. The Mjolnir shields are directly repurposed from Covenant technology. In addition to that, Spartan armor really isn't anything special without a Spartan itself. You know, a Spartan, by the way, who is physiologically enhanced. You put some random guy in a Spartan armor, it's pretty much useless. You need a big strong Spartan that has been genetically modified and enhanced over fucking decades just to make this thing work. So were all those separate technologies part of the Gene Song as well? Did the librarian implant Halsey with the idea to kidnap children and turn them into T-800s? Oh god, my head hurts. Also, wait, did the librarian even plan on the Spartan armor having shields? Because that's kind of their most important feature. Anyone who's played Halo Reach knows that a single shot from a DMR in the head can instantly kill a Spartan without his shields. What? The DMR uses 7.62mm NATO rounds for its cartridge, which, fun fact, is a real ammunition type that we use right now. So the armor is pretty crap without the shields. Did the librarian account for that? Did she expect Master Chief to just be rolling up an armor weak enough to be killed by some GI with an M14 500 years ago? Oh, make it stop, make it stop. So wait, did the librarian also intend for the Covenant to invent shield technology? So then they would get into a war with humanity, so humanity would then repurpose and reverse engineer those shield technologies, and then use that on the Mjolnir armor as well. Seems kind of risky. What happens if, oh I don't know, the Covenant just wipe out humanity? Is that all part of the plan? If you're already implanting the blueprints for an AI in Spartan armor, can't you at least imprint the instructions for, I don't know, basic energy shields? That seems kind of more important than the other ones. Also, wait a second, you have the ability to make humans immune to the Composer. Why not just make all humans immune to the Composer while you're at it? Like seriously, why would you not just do this in the first place instead of adding some weird rigmarole riddle so only one guy gets immune instead? Just give it to everybody and be done with it. Honestly, that's a way simpler solution than hoping some guy will randomly stumble upon Requiem in a Mjolnir armor that you also imprinted humanity with so that he can then be blessed with your Jesus power so he can save Earth. Oh god, the voices. Hey librarian, I have a question. So when you made humanity destined to create Spartans, did you also have them destined to use it on insurrectionists? Did you plan for them to be used on poor outer colony space farmers? Wait, so Spartans were literally created to fight the insurrection. Was the insurrection pre-planned too? 
What about the Covenant's arrival? Did either of these two things get pre-planned by you too, Librarian? Because how else would the Spartan program have been created without the rebellion in the outer human colonies? What if there was no rebellion? What if the outer colonies got taxation with representation and the rioting and terrorism never happened? What if the Covenant showed up and there was no shady Oni Spartan program to fight them? Also, wait a minute. What if Master Chief wasn't the one Spartan to survive? What if he like just died randomly throughout the war? Would there have been another Spartan to take his place? What if there were no Spartans? Would it be some random guy instead? Or did you plan everything out so that one specific Spartan called John was created through a performance enhancing program from a shady organization that you also created, who then would wear Mjolnir armor, which you also created, and would then be gifted an intelligent AI, which you also created and pre-planned inside humanity, and that Spartan would stumble on your doorstep to stop the didact? <sighs> oh god. Yeah. That, uh, that's, uh, that's how 343 writes their games. Just leaving it out there. So looping all the way back to where we started, the original point. 343 insists that the Forerunners were different to humans. Bungie insists that they were the same. And no tiny bit of entry logs or web comics can convince me otherwise. Bungie's true visions were obvious when you play the original Halo trilogy. Humanity were descendants of the Forerunners. It works with the plot and it's explicitly stated to the audience over and over. Imagine if you were watching Empire Strikes Back, if you will. That awesome reveal of Darth Vader being Luke's father. It's a neat twist that adds to both characters. Kind of closing the loop of Luke being an orphan as well as Darth Vader's fascination with Luke. It also creates a great meaningful climax where Darth Vader shows a bit more depth as a character and does the right thing in the end. It's great classic storytelling. Now imagine, if you will, that a spin-off comic came out in the early 80s, like around the same time as Empire. And in this comic, they said that Darth Vader wasn't really Luke's father. Rather, he was some guy named Larry. It explains that when Larry told Luke that he was his father, he was actually being metaphorical. He was metaphorically Luke's father, but biologically had no relation. And Luke's father was some unimportant guy lying dead in a ditch somewhere. One of those reveals is clearly better than the other, while the other one just kind of ruins the simplicity of a basic, easy to see twist. A twist that also carries thematic weight. This is exactly what happened to Halo. What was originally a really deep twist that added so much depth to the Forerunners, humanity, and even the context of the Human Covenant War as a whole, now has an even greater importance than what was originally thought of. Finally, you understand why the Prophets feared humanity so much, especially knowing their worship of this idolized view of the Forerunners themselves. It also explains why the humans have a connection to Forerunner technology. Monitors recognize them. The portal to the Ark is literally located on Earth and Forerunner technology can literally only be accessed by human DNA. You know, perhaps the DNA of the people who made it thousands of years ago. But no. Instead, 343 wants the Forerunners to be these generic vampire monster men. They're no longer the all-powerful beings they were once thought to be. Instead, they were generic bad guys who had generic guns and generic bad guy plots, and their entire mystique was gone. Also, in a way, they ruin the tragedy of the Human Covenant War because now humanity truly is just some worthless, fledgling civilization. And in a way, hilariously, they make the prophets of the Covenant completely right. Not only is humanity not the descendants of the Forerunners, but they were literally the Forerunners' sworn enemy. Imagine fucking up so badly that you completely vindicate the villains of the previous three games in a single cutscene. So yeah, fuck you 343, fuck you anyone who defends this change, the humans are Forerunners, this is the hill I'll die on. I am ordering you. TO SURRENDER THAT AI! Anyways, my rant on Prometheans and Reclaimers and 343 aside, I was originally going to use this section to list off some more gripes that I had with the story, mainly the story revolving around, you know, human characters. However, the more I looked into it, the more I realized most of my issues revolved around one thing, and one thing only. Melodrama. I don't like melodrama. At all. That's just a personal thing. Which is probably why I like first-person shooters to begin with. If my problems involve anything less than the destruction of Earth and or a possible interdimensional hell invasion, then you aren't doing an FPS right. Also, first person shooters are a great way to problem solve. No moping around, letting a problem linger until it gets out of control. Nope, here you can solve all your problems right away with a little bit of lead. Plus, why waste time on some melodramatic cutscenes when I could actually be out there fucking shooting at shit? Oh man, we're trapped in here! We're screwed! We're screwed, man! Stow the belly aching, soldier. Remember, you're a leatherneck. Damn straight. In retrospect, Halo really never had that much melodrama. Sure, it had some drama, but that was drama over stuff like an entire alien race getting genocided, or an ancient parasite hive mind trying to take over, or a massive ring world that can wipe out all sentient life in the galaxy being activated. You know, real problems. 
You see, there was never a scene where a character cried, or moped, or yelled at each other, or got angry, or cried, or yelled, or got angry, or cried, or got angry, or got angry, or cried, or moped, or got angry, or cried, or cried, or cried, or... But here, it's the entire story! Sometimes characters will literally yell, get angry, cry, and mope, all in the span of like two minutes. Now I should specify, I don't hate character conflict. What I hate are characters who should know better and should be at the top of their game, acting like complete children. In Bungie's Halo, the UNSC were, for a military losing all their footing on the galaxy, at the top of their fucking game. There was never a scene where a bunch of marines cried together as Reach fell, or got angry at one another and started yelling, or moped around. No, they had bigger problems to worry about, and they would worry about those instead. They were constantly ready to fight in a no-win scenario, no matter the costs. In the Bungie games, we got these little moments that could be considered, you know, sadness, despair, these little emotional scenes. But not only is it handled tastefully and quietly, but it doesn't distract said character from being alert and ready for a fight. Sergeant Johnson loses his entire platoon, his captain, two ship worths of marines, and ultimately Miranda. He shows remorse and despair, but he's immediately ready for a suicide mission at the end of Halo 3. Like, there's no doubt in his mind, he's ready to get back to work. Oh hey, let's talk about my favorite Halo character and 343's least favorite character, Cortana. I'm not sure why the fuck 343 has such a hate boner for her. She's a sexy blue hologram with sass and brains. That's all she needs to be for Halo 1, and as far as I'm concerned, that's all she needs to be as a character. For Halo 2 and 3, her relationship with Chief was stronger, but her personality still didn't change. She was cocky, smart, and very much willing to weigh the pros and cons of any situation, no matter the cost of herself. She is an AI built to defend humanity, and that is her entire focus in the Bungie games. She is selfless, yet she doesn't have any reservations towards it. Hell, Cortana is willing to fucking sacrifice herself at the end of Halo 2 to blow up high charity without so much of a peep, just in case Delta Halo gets activated. Sure, by Halo 3, she's damaged and on the verge of breaking down, but the second she reunites with Master Chief, she is ready to go into yet another suicide mission just for the chance to save humanity. Then we get to Halo 4. In Halo 4, Cortana is basically a different character. I don't know who this character is. This isn't Cortana I know. She's mopey, she's sad, she's quiet, and she's emotional. She lashes out, she's afraid of everything. She's also afraid of the prospect of being shut down and ultimately lets herself get in the way of the mission because of this. Yeah, uh, who is this? Who is this character? This isn't Cortana. The Cortana I know wouldn't risk a mission to save humanity just for the prospect of staying with John. She also wouldn't lash out, get angry, or fucking throw a temper tantrum on the bridge of a huge UNSC ship revealing to everybody how insane she is for being given an order. And I know exactly what the comments are about to say too. Andy, she's going through rampancy. She's going rampant. That's why she's so crazy. Okay, first, using up made up sci-fi lingo for a character acting out of character? doesn't really work with me. I like the idea of AIs going rampant after seven years because their learning algorithm is probably so complicated it'll deteriorate after a certain point. That's a cool sci-fi concept. I like that. I also like how it's a direct reference to Marathon, to the point where the first couple stages of rampancy in that game are sort of used here, that being Cortana's sadness and her eventual anger. But using that as an excuse for Cortana completely acting out of character is just a weak excuse to me. Because to me, the character I know at the end of Halo 3 is no longer the same character at the start of Halo 4. It's like that character died off screen and we never got to see her again. This is also something a lot of mediocre writers will do out of convenience, where if they want a character to act a certain way in a story, they'll just add in off-screen character development so the character can be that way from the start. There's no desire to, oh, I don't know, show off how a character can change going through different events, maybe go through some development with the audience. No subtle moments that change how a character thinks and sees the world, maybe a change in perspective or a regression of ideals to give them a thoughtful and intriguing arc. Nope, none of that. Instead, it's, oh, she went rampant before Halo 4 and 5, now she's throwing temper tantrums and she's evil and wants to rule the universe. That's bullshit. Bullshit! Give me a subtle change in character. Show me Cortana as she slowly deteriorates over the course of a game. If you want Cortana to be a weak, annoying, moping psycho, I hate you. But at the very least, make it a slow and subtle transformation. If you want Cortana to go rampant, then show her going rampant. Show me that you at least understand what her character was before Halo 4, then show her changing later in the game. Start the game off as Cortana from Halo 3, confident, cocky, smart, and mission-focused. Then, over the course of a game or two, 
Show me how she changes her ideas, how her perspective changes, or how her dedication to humanity and the mission is slowly fading away. Is it so hard to ask for just actual character development than just a character being changed off screen and being told that that's character development instead? Don't just say the word rampancy and then shrug your shoulders like that's enough of an explanation. Like that doesn't mean anything. It doesn't. It's a made up lore term that only means anything to people reading from a wiki page, but to someone playing this game right after playing Halo 3, it doesn't hold any weight. Man. If only Bungie had tackled this years ago in showing a character go through a massive change, changing factions and ultimately becoming a different person at the end of it. Yeah, of course, I'm talking about the Arbiter. Remember this guy? The guy who started off as a high-ranking, loyal, supreme commander of the Covenant into a rebellious foot soldier helping humanity stop the Covenant? Yeah, this guy. They gave the Arbiter an entire game's worth of character development before he was even paired side by side with Master Chief. And he's remembered as being one of the best characters from the entire franchise. It's almost like people actually like seeing character development. They love seeing a character's opinions and ideals change to fit their experiences. Sort of like what actual people do. The Arbiter is a result of good writing with a desire to keep his change slow and gradual. Like there's never a sudden moment where he's a different character. He starts off as a disgraced but loyal warrior, he gains some self-doubt with the Prophets but is nonetheless loyal, then he is ultimately betrayed and loses his trust with the Prophets and the Brutes, but he's still hostile to humanity and still kinda believes the Great Journey and is arguably still as stubborn as he was before. He then sees the Covenant tearing itself from the inside, he begins to question the entire purpose of the war, and in one instance he is finally helped by a human. This ultimately teaches him to accept the truth about Halo, the lie of the Great Journey, and he finally respects humanity in an alliance. This is top tier character development. And do you know what? They did it all without Arbiter crying, moping, or yelling. Yep, Bungie in their heyday, what can I say? Also, the Cortana from Halo 1, 2, and 3 would not let herself succumb to rampancy, especially if it put her mission in jeopardy. If Cortana was even worried that there was a slight danger of letting herself stay online, she would willingly shut herself down before it got out of hand. Again, we're talking about the chick who was willing to blow herself up just in case. She had no dispositions determining herself in any other game. So long as it's about protecting humanity and the UNSC, she's willing to do it. That is literally her job. So if this ever happened to Halo 3 Cortana, who might as well just be a different character to Halo 4 Cortana, who are we kidding? But if Halo 3 Cortana went rampant, she'd probably quickly self-terminate the second she glitched and almost jeopardized a mission. Hey, if you were a smart writer, you could have a pretty neat interaction between Chief and Cortana from this. I don't know, these characters are just completely acting out of character for Halo 4. I just want some consistency. I want some good character interactions, not what we're given. At the end of the day, Chief and Cortana are both soldiers. They're both fighting for a mission and a cause that's greater than them. They might have a bond with each other, but that doesn't mean they jeopardize the whole of fucking humanity over one another. Chief leaves Cortana behind on High Jerry without so much of a word, because he knows having her there to blow it up, just in case, is the best course of action for humanity. Sure, he rescues her at the end of Halo 3, but he knew that there was a chance that they'd never see each other again, and he was willing to take that risk. This is why Halo's characters kick ass because they don't spend the entire game moping around crying and yelling at each other like children. They have a mission to save the galaxy and there's nothing else as important as that. So yeah, if Halo 4 had actually focused on Cortana's character, as opposed to just showing her as a moping, sad, emotional chick, I wouldn't be complaining like I am now. Speaking of Cortana's outbreaks, can someone explain to me what's going on in this scene with her and Del Rio? Once again, why are they yelling at each other? Why is Del Rio yelling at a Spartan? Why is he so hell-bent on getting back to Earth instead of stopping the alien monster guy that crippled his ship? When I talk about melodrama, this is what I mean. Two characters who, you know what, both have pretty reasonable takes and opinions and courses of action, acting and yelling like complete children instead of simply talking it out. Cortana knows that the didact has to be stopped. However, Del Rio thinks that he should simply reassemble with the fleet at Earth, since he's by himself with a single ship and a single crew. And he's also not aware of the didact's intentions, because honestly, it doesn't make a lot of sense for why the didact would want to attack humanity directly with as small of a fleet as he has. But that's not the point. Both courses of action are pretty reasonable. So instead of talking it out like, oh, I don't know, two reasonable adults, they fucking get in a shouting match like kids. Children do this. On one hand, we have Cortana, the smartest AI to date, and also one of the last surviving AIs of the Human Covenant War. We also have Del Rio, a guy who is almost 60 with 30 years of naval service under his belt, and he was decorated enough to be given command of the largest human ship ever constructed. We're talking about a guy whose entire military service occurred at the start and the end of the Human Covenant War. So why would someone who is, presumably, a decorated naval vet, experienced in fighting the Covenant, 
you know, the actual Covenant, much less this puny splinter faction, and he has done so since they first invaded until they were defeated at Earth, why would this guy be yelling at another, even more respected war hero who fought in the exact same war? A war hero who, mind you, saved the galaxy twice. Cause melodrama, that's why. Gosh, if only this was shown in another Halo game. You know, a scene where an old decorated human admiral had to weigh the risks of protecting Earth from an approaching threat, versus venturing to some artificial forerunner world on the whim that it may be the way to truly finish the war. Oh yeah, I remember that. Remember the scene where Lord Hood yelled at Master Chief and Shipmaster and Arbiter and screamed for them to be arrested? Huh. Oh wait. He loses his temper once, immediately cools off, then accepts an arrangement where Chief and a contingent of Marines will take along with the elites to the Ark, while the rest of humanity's forces remain at Earth. Do you trust Cortana that much? Sir. Yes, sir. You see, this is what I like in my stories. Characters thinking and figuring things out without acting like infants. So that's all I'm saying. I fucking hate melodrama. It has no place in Halo. Oh god, I've already spent this long rambling about the plot alone. God, if this keeps up, I'm gonna have to split this video into two parts. That'd be pretty inconvenient. Part 2 is going to release in exactly one week, but if you want to watch it early, you can go subscribe to my Patreon and watch it there. 